It's a pleasure and an honor to host the former president of the Republic of China, Ma Zhou, for today's discussion. As everyone knows, he was president from 2008 to 2016. Before that, he was in a series of very important positions, including mayor of, of Taipei and minister of justice. He was educated at Taiwan National University, right? Yep. And received his LLM down the street at NYU right. and his SJD at Harvard. His career in a lot of ways emphasizes why it's so important that people from Asia, students from Asia come here to the United States, study, go back home and have enormous impacts on their societies. I met the future president in 1976, I think when you were just starting at Harvard Law School and I was just finishing at Harvard Law School and our mentor, both of our, uh, the mentor of both of us, uh, Jerry Cohen, introduced us. He says, there's this fellow from Taiwan, not knowing that he would then go on uh, to be president of the Republic of China. You know, under his leadership, we all remember cross-strait relations were peaceful and prosperous with agreements between Taiwan and mainland China reaching new levels that had never been seen before. I was fortunate at that time to own a business in Taiwan and had about 1,200 employees then. It's funny, I still remember one day, you, you were president, and I got up in the morning and I had, I had breakfast with my colleagues in Taipei. I went to the airport, I took a flight to Shanghai. I, had, I took the, the uh, maglev from Pudong Airport to downtown to have lunch. I then took the maglev back, got on the nonstop from Shanghai to New York, and had dinner on the same day with my mother. <laughs> so I got off the flight, had dinner with my mother. I thought that cross-strait relations, because of you, because of what was going on, had permanently changed. In retrospect, I was wrong. At the end of your presidency, you met, I believe it was 2015, you went to Singapore and met mm -hmm. with, with Xi Jinping. Um, tell us about that meeting and tell us kind of what it felt like to kind of meet with Xi Jinping and have these discussions since no leader um, of the Republic of China had done that before. That is a very important uh, decision in my life to meet as president of the ROC with uh, the president of uh, uh, PRC. And uh, we have, of course, we have uh, to do a lot of uh, preparations. And uh, when, we, when we met, uh, we discussed uh, um, many issues uh, that concerns us. And I found out that uh, we do have uh, many things in common, and, and we should work on that. And uh, particularly when the news uh, was out that I'm going to meet with Xi Jinping, it's very interesting the reaction of the leader of the DPP. They certainly um, didn't like that very much. But on the other hand, the current president, Tsai Ing-wen, says she also wants to meet with Xi Jinping. <laughs> 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 I think that's good because I think. Uh, dialogue is better than confrontation, and we need a lot of dialogue. We don't need confrontation. And in uh, Xi Jinping, when we met with him, I uh, particularly told him that uh, <clears throat> women, that the two sides should uh, stick to the 92 consensus. Uh, that would be, that, that is uh, <clears throat> one China. Uh, respective interpretations. And I said, uh, when we said we want to have our own interpretation, that, that won't be uh, uh, two Chinas, one China, one Taiwan, or Taiwan independence. We, I did that because I want to make him, him sure that we're working on a situation which both sides could benefit. And this is probably the only way to solve the problem between Taiwan and the mainland. 
And uh, uh, unfortunately, after I uh, stepped down, and the government was taken by the DPP, and they uh, do not seem to know very much about how to deal with this, this situation. So the cross-strait relations uh, uh, wasn't very stable. And uh, particularly after I left, this is something that worries me very much. And, uh, you know, uh, for, for Taiwan, I think the only hope is to have a, a clock with the mainland, stabilize the situation, and try to uh, make it better, not just for Taiwanese, but also for, for the mainland. So this is what I want. Uh, so I certainly welcome your comments on what I did in the last uh, uh, 10, 20 years. And I hope uh, we have a chance to uh, realize what I have thought for many, many years. When you say realize, what, 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 what do you mean? That we see some political solution to the cross-strait issues? Not in a short time. But people we do, in Taiwan, we do have our problems. The, ours, uh, the, the, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, wouldn't want to have the kind of relations with the mainland. And, but so far, my successor, she has been in power for seven years, but very little can be done. This, this is what uh, worries me, because uh, the two sides have to uh, get together, have dialogue, and try to work out uh, solutions to the current problems we have. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I, I, people talk about the uh, 2027. That's the end of uh, Xi Jinping's term. Mm -hmm. Whether something you know, critical could be done uh, by then, I hope. Uh, I hope not so. I hope we could, uh, through our efforts, we can gradually uh, stabilize the situation and make uh, the, the cross relations um, a, something that will help both of the countries. So talk about you. Let's go back and talk about your administration and some of the, what I made reference to, some of the firsts. As I had, was on Taiwan, there were all of these things which you, your administration was able to do because of the uh, 92 consensus. The mainland was willing to compromise on a number of issues. Talk about some of those and how they benefited the people on Taiwan. Well, 92 consensus was uh, reached in 1992. I personally involved all this, and uh, it's uh, very, very important that uh, the other side is willing to come along in, in on this issue. Uh, so, in my eight years of uh, presidency, we have concluded 23 agreements, 23 agreements with uh, the mainland. That's what is unprecedented. Yeah. And I think it's very good for Taiwan. It's good, very good for the mainland. And, uh, uh, and certainly, uh, it was not really succeeded by, my, uh, by, the, by President Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, so this is something uh, uh, I, I believe uh, we should do. So the first recommendation, uh, recommendation that I want to make is that uh, leaders of Taiwan should strict, strict, uh, strictly adhere to the Constitution of the Republic of China and the act governing relations between peoples of the Taiwan area and of the mainland area. This means returning to the common political foundation that existed during my tenure, which is the 1992 consensus, meaning one China, respective interpretations. Only through this can mutual trust be established between Taiwan and mainland China, and tensions across the Taiwan Strait can be reduced. At the same time, mainland China, mainland China should also exercise patience and seize military and quasi-military actions that threaten the use of force in order to reassure the people of Taiwan. Uh, I think you all remember that on November 16, 1992, New Era began in cross-strait relations 
with the establishment of the 1992 consensus. According to the consensus, both sides of Taiwan Strait adhere to the One China Principle in their prospective constitutions. However, they can verbal, verbally express the different interpretation of One China, which constitute the essence of the consensus, meaning seeking common ground with, while respecting differences. Because of the 1992 consensus, Taiwan and mainland China were able to sign 23 agreements, which is unprecedented in the history of the two sides, covering almost all walks of life. All of my ministers during my tenure had direct and corresponding channels of communication with their mainland China counterparts to address issues of mutual concern. Through this approach, we were able to overcome many of the challenges we face. So the existence of the 1992 consensus served as a guardrail for a cross-strait peace. However, since I left office, the subsequent Democratic Progressive Party DPP government has consistently refused to accept the 1992 consensus, which may, which may escalate tension across Taiwan Strait, making the future of cross strait relations highly uncertain. The up, upcoming presidential election in January 2024 is therefore crucial. If the new president is willing to accept the 1992 consensus, the possibility of cross-strait peace becomes likely and viable. My second recommendation is that friendly countries, including the United States, should encourage Taiwan should encourage Taiwan to have a di dialogue with the mainland rather than encourage Taiwan leaders, <coughs> particularly currently the, the Democratic Progressive Party, to move toward Taiwan independence, Taiwan independence, and even transforming Taiwan into a second Ukraine. In Western societies recently, there is a saying, Taiwan is Ukraine. Ukraine uh, today's Ukraine is tomorrow's Taiwan. This is absolutely wrong. Taiwan is not Ukraine, and cross strait relations differ greatly from the Russian-Ukraine relations. Russian and Ukraine are two independent states, while Taiwan and mainland China are not. After the separation across the Taiwan Strait that started in 1949, both sides maintain the One China principle in their respective constitutions. For the Republic of China, the China means that con constitution refers uh, <coughs> the constitution refers to the Republic of China itself. According to the respective constitution on both sides, cross strait relations are not relations between two countries, but between two regions, Taiwan region and the mainland region of one China, which are fundamentally different. Our constitution, as well as the mainland's constitution, affirms that cross-strait relations do not involve the separate countries and leave room for the possibility of future integration, which distinguish it from Russia-Ukraine relationship. So the current ruling party, President Tsai Ing-wen, the Democratic Progressive Party, has repeatedly advocated the People's Republic and the Republic of China are not subordinate to each other. In, in Chinese, well, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, they have also changed the Republic of China National Day to Taiwan National Day. Before I came to the United States, uh, before our National Day, October the 3rd, the, the 10th, I specifically refused to attend the National Day uh, ceremony in Taipei because I said, you put in the, uh, uh, the, the, the billboard Taiwan National, uh, Taiwan National Day. Uh, Taiwan National Day. Taiwan National Day. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is not a country. It doesn't have a national day. It should be Republic of China National Day. I did it very seriously, and that gave rise to a lot of discussions. Uh, so these statements are in violation, violation of our constitution and are seen as provocative towards cross-relation. 
potentially escalating tensions and deterioration, President Tsai's actions are effectively signaling a move toward Taiwan independence on the international stage, which poses the risk of dangerous military conflict through the Taiwan Strait. This is the stance openly opposed by countries including the United States, Europe, and Japan, and the majority of the Taiwanese people. However, I have noticed that the deteriorating relationship between the United States and mainland China has provided room for the Tsai Ing-wen government's Taiwan independence agenda to develop, especially recent statements and positions from some individuals in the United States have shown a tendency to turn Taiwan into a second Ukraine. I must strongly emphasize the people of Taiwan's vehement oppose such assertions and actions. I, I'll give you an example. This year, comments from former U.S. officials, congressional members, and some think tank reporters have almost uniformly mentioned that the shocking idea of destroying the TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturer Company, which is a, a giant in uh, uh, production of semiconductor, and to put the TSMC in advance to prevent it from falling into the hands of men in China, which has deeply unsettled the people of Taiwan. Even former U.S. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien has also advocated for the Taiwan government to issue an AK-47 rifle to everyone as a preparation for countering the invading men in China forces in the city. The vast majority of Taiwanese people consider this a ludicrous and unimaginable suggestion. I must solemnly emphasize that while we appreciate the support of our American friends, we do not welcome thinking that completely disregard the real situation in Taiwan, ignores the cross-strait relations, and even consider a weaponization of Taiwan. I believe the best way to prevent further escalation of tension between the United States and China, which could impact global order, is for the United States and Western society to encourage peaceful negotiation between Taiwan and the mainland China. This approach aims to prevent a conflict in the Taiwan Strait. The United States should play a role in encouraging dialogue between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait and seeking peace. Those individuals who view TSMC, the uh, chip company, as a weapon and tend to turn Taiwan into a battlefield without considering the safety and well-being of the Taiwanese people, as well as those who replace facts with rumors and interfere in Taiwan's elections, are highly unwelcome to become uh, to the people of Taiwan. The U.S. government should strongly address such action. So in fact, there's a lot of room for dialogue and cooperation between the two sides. On March 27 this year, I led a group of 30 Taiwanese university students and two professors on a 12-day visit to mainland China. During our visit, I not only paid respect to my ancestors in the tomb in Hunan province, but also engaged in academic exchanges with Hunan University, uh, Wuhan University and Fudan University. This marked the first visit of mainland China by a retired president of the Republic of China. Throughout the visit, many domestic and international openings, opinions view our journey as a new chapter in cross-strait exchange, easing the tension in cross-strait relations in recent years and send, sending message of a peace to the entire region and the world. In July, mid-July this year, we also invited 37 mainland Chinese university students to visit Taiwan. In addition to the three universities mentioned earlier, we expanded the list to include Beijing University and Tsinghua University, led by former President Hao Ping, you probably know him, of Beijing University. This visit was also highly successful and enable further exchanges between students from both sides. The future of cross relations belongs to the younger generation, after all. 
when young people from both sides increase their mutual understanding and friendship, the risk of war and conflict is inevitably reduced. So these two visits have effectively reduced the tension and confrontation that have prevailed across the Taiwan Strait for the past seven years since the DPP came to power. They have also drawn international attention to the fact that cross-strait relations do not necessarily have to lead to armed conflict and that peaceful outcomes are attainable through engagement. In fact, during my visit to the mainland China, opinion polls in Taiwan indicate that 77% of the people supported my decision. This is ample proof that the people of Taiwan yearn for a return to peace, stability, and prosperity in cross-strait relations. Earlier this month, I went to Singapore to, particip to participate in a forum commemorating founding Prime Minister Li Guangyao, where Prime Minister Li, Li, Xian, Li Xianlong, the current Prime Minister, invited me to share my thoughts. I emphasized the importance of inviting representatives from both sides of the Taiwan Strait to engage in dialogue and attempt to find peaceful solutions. This is a fantastic opportunity to enhance the mutual understanding. If Taiwan and mainland China can each can reach some sort of consensus, it may also reduce conflict between mainland China and the United States. Upon finishing my speech, the audience erupted in enthusiastic applause, indicating a strong agreement with the idea. In Singapore, I once again urge Western countries to encourage Taiwan uh, and the mainland to engage in dialogue on how to address the current tense situation. I hope that people who care about the situation, not only in Asia, but all, all around the world, can uh, encourage Taiwan and many in China to resume dialogue and find a solution. During my eight-year presidency from 2008 to 2016, no country in the world believed that there would be a war across Taiwan Strait. From my experience in office, it is clear that cross-strait peace is entirely possible. I hope that in the Republic of China's next year's presidential election in January, the president elected by the people of Taiwan can chart a path that opposes Taiwan independence, seek peace, and avoid war. I, de I believe this is the most essential devel development needed in the world right now today, so that Taiwan will not become a second Ukraine. Thank you. The, um, isn't, so we talk about applause, you talk about polling, you talk about it, but Taiwan is a democracy. Isn't the test going to be in January's election that if people mm -hmm. think, you know, we should move back to the 92 consensus that they'll vote for the KMT. If they believe that the DPP policies are correct, they'll stay with the DPP. Well, this is a, a very uh, important moment for the people in Taiwan to decide. But the, isn't the, is this going to is this election in January going to be a referendum? on the 92 consensus? Yeah, in a, way. in a way. What's the outlook for the KMT? Um, so far, the, our candidates' uh, uh, support is uh, s slowly uh, going up. Uh, this is uh, a good sign, but, it sh but he still needs more support in order to get elected. If the non, so you have the DPP candidate, you have three other candidates, are they splitting? The anti DPP vote? Yeah. yeah. What are the chances that we'll see two of those three candidates drop out so that you only have one candidate? Uh, generally speaking, we think probably we need uh, uh, one more month to know the result. Now, all these, uh, all these three, three, four people are competing very seriously. So, we should expect that come the end of November, they'll be, it will be much clearer. It picture. will be clearer. Yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, election will take place on the 13th of uh, January. Yeah. Right. So as long as this, the, the dropping out occurs before 
January 13th, mm -hmm. it's okay. Yeah. When do, is there early voting in Taiwan? No. So people have to go back to Taiwan. That's right. That's right. Uh, to vote. The, um, the economic benefits that accrued to the people on Taiwan as a result of mm -hmm. your presidency were, were quite obvious. Yeah. yeah. Why did the DPP win the election in 2016? Well, then, and what lessons are there for 2024? Again, that has something to do with uh, our candidate at the time. Not, not very, not, not very uh, united. But this time, people will understand that this issue really will affect our life and our children's life. So, so the, the KMT candidate should make the argument, this is existential for Taiwan, mm -hmm. right. that the choice of the KMT candidate would be a choice for peaceful cross-strait exactly. relations, cross whereas the, war. Yeah. the, the war, and, war, war, war or peace. When you stepped down, I mean, you were term limited, so you didn't lose the election. You were term limited. Um, did you foresee that this is what would happen in cross-strait relations? Did, so in two, when, when you stepped down and oh. Tsai Ing-wen was elected, did you kind of understand what the progress was going to be or the lack of progress in cross-strait relations? I didn't ex uh, foresee the situation could be this bad. <laughs> so we often debate in the United States you know, among Taiwan experts, people who focus on U.S.-Taiwan relations. Mm -hmm. And we all recognize how bad it is today. Did the change occur because there was a decision in Beijing, or did the change occur because of the election of Tsai Ing-wen? Both. Both. Talk about Beijing. The, when Tsai Ing-wen made her Inaugural, inaugural address. You know, she talked about the 92 consensus in a way that wasn't what you had done, but it wasn't a total rejection either. Beijing could have accepted that and continued discussions. Why do you think Beijing didn't? Well, they, I think I think when China was first elected, Beijing are uh, uh, watching what uh, she's going to do. But, and eventually, they, they're very disappointed. So saying that if she had been, if she had completely accepted the 92 consensus, we would have seen a different result? I think so. So Beijing was, was open, open to that. Talk about, so during your eight years, uh, Taiwan, lost one diplomatic ally, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? So there was only Gambia. one country yeah, that, that established diplomatic relations with right. the People's Republic. Yeah. During Tsai Ing-wen's term, we've seen, I think, nine? Nine. Nine additional? Yeah. Why do you think the mainland continues to allow Taiwan to have any? Couldn't they just buy everybody and just... Taiwan wouldn't have diplomatic relations with any country? I wouldn't exclude that possibility. Uh, you know, the, uh, of course, when I was president, we, I care very much about uh, our, our, our uh, uh, diplomacy, diplomacy and our friends. So I was, so I was able to keep uh, uh, nine members. And uh, uh, I'm sorry. Was it was mine for originally 21. Yeah. yeah, there were 21 yeah. and then it dropped down to, to, it, yeah. to 13 now. That's right. That's right. But, or 12. But uh, even uh, that, I think we still have 13. Yeah. Um, but why does China allow for even the 13? Why? Yeah. <laughs> well, why is it in their interest to? <laughs> They were not able to get more anyway. Oh, so they, you think that this is the limit that they can get? No, no, they probably have uh, potential to get more, but not at that time. No. Will you see Xi Jinping again? 
Do you want to see Xi Jinping again? Well, I don't have any plans at the moment. Uh, when I went to mainland uh, early this year, I decided to stay out of Beijing. Right, I saw that. Yeah, and so I so that I so I was able to uh, pay a tribute to my uh, uh, dead grandfather and, and all that. And uh, certainly, I will be planning to do it again uh, next year. And I will see whether uh, there will be a good opportunity to see the, the people I want to see. Also with students? Yeah. Yeah, it's great to see so many young students in the audience today. It's really, I think the idea that this is the next generation yeah. is absolutely right. I you, think that is precisely what the issues... Maybe you should ask them to tell... To, to, to speak their story. Yes, yes. You know, I will talk to you in the the uh, we will in a moment. The the most dangerous moment in the last eight years. In fact, the most dangerous moment in a very very long time, possibly since uh, the civil the, the actual fighting in the civil war ended, was when Speaker Pelosi visited That's right. Taiwan. That's right. Should she have visited Taiwan? No. I think uh, even people that believe that uh, it wasn't a the best moment for uh, for he, for her to visit. Yeah. And was the DPP unable to say, "Please don't come"? <laughs> I think the, the DPP might want her might want her to come. They wanted her to come. Yeah, because clearly that was. A very dangerous time. It required the U.S. government and the Chinese government at a time when U.S.-China relations were extremely uh, difficult. Right, right. Uh, required us to meet every day, or required the U.S. government and the Chinese government to literally meet every day to make sure there was not a mishap that caused the loss of life. Okay. So that was that was that was troubling. Um, Xi Jinping still wants to have peaceful reunification. Uh, she said, he said that uh, in principle, they would use a peaceful unification, but they will never forgive uh, on the use uh, of force. Yes. yes. Yeah. So what does that look like in your mind when we talk about peaceful reunification or what does Taiwan look like? Does it maintain its government? Does it maintain its military? Does it maintain its way of life? What, what is the concept of peaceful reunification? <laughs> very good question. I think very few people have thought about, thought about that. But in my view, uh, in, to take my presidency as an example, I think that is probably people will uh, accept we maintain relations with Mainland uh, with uh, 13 uh, uh, diplomatic allies and the trade, as you know. Uh, the last year was about uh, uh, 350 billion US dollars and Taiwan uh, had a uh, favorable in, uh, uh, imbalance. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a good year. I'm sure people in Taiwan can accept that. And, we, and people also, after my trip to the, to the mainland uh, earlier this year, the opinion poll in Taiwan shows that 77% of the people support it. But the question more is, you know, when we talk about Clearly, in my view, it's in U.S. interest to see a peaceful relationship, one where there is no threat of military force between the mainland and Taiwan. But the question, so if you're going to move in that direction, what does Taiwan put on the table? To, so let's say the 92 consensus is accepted again, whether you know, William Lai decides he's going to accept it, which would be very surprising, or the KMT candidate says... We're going to accept it. So what, what do we talk about with the mainland? Keeping the military? 
So Taiwan retains its military, keeping the government, keeping everyday life, you know, just having kind of a, a fiscal kind of uh, unification, but politically remains completely independent? Well, it really depends on how you interpret it, uh, the situation. Certainly, the people of Taiwan want peace. Okay. And uh, people of Taiwan also, they want not only their identity, but also a, uh, the, 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 that, that's exactly what the status quo means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking beyond the status quo. I'm looking at what, you know, a way where we can have real peace. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of in the, in the days when you were president, and I would talk with the Taiban, you know, they really were, were talking about ways that we could have real peace for forever. Uh, that clearly, I, those kinds of conversations don't occur, don't <laughs> occur anymore. So two quick questions, and then we'll, we'll end this part of the program. Uh, President Xi and President Biden are likely to meet um, next month on the sidelines of the APEC meeting. Uh, what would you tell President Biden to say about Taiwan? <laughs> very, very interesting question. Well, certainly for the moment, for the time being, certainly we want to maintain the status quo. I mean that we should uh, um, keep the thir 13 uh, diplomatic allies and uh, we should, uh, uh, <clears throat> the two sides should maintain uh, peace without any uh, military uh, adventurism and we also uh, keep the, the, the interflow of uh, people across the Taiwan Strait. And uh, as you know, the amount of trade uh, reached roughly 350 billion, with the Taiwan having a relatively large uh, trade surplus. This is, I think, is what the Taiwanese people would like to have. You're addressing an American audience. This, this video will be viewed by tens of thousands of Americans. So last question is, what do you want the American people to know about Taiwan? What's the most important thing? Uh, yesterday, the, 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 the day before yesterday, I invite my professor, Jim Cohen. Yeah, and my professor. To, <laughs> to, 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 to come. And he loved to tell us uh, an old joke that when he talked about uh, uh, Taiwan, I asked the people, uh, what do you think about Taiwan? And American people said, oh, I love Thai food. <laughs> they mixed up Taiwan and, and Thailand. So the, the, he, he loves to tell that story. So the Americans might not understand very well what is the difference, but the, they are... <clears throat> Um, 23 million Taiwanese, and they have had a very uh, viable economy and uh, a very high quality uh, uh, citizens. So this is part of the uh, status quo and has to be maintained. And looking for the future, let me tell you, let me, you should remember that when I was president, I was able to conclude 23 agreement with the mainland and keep the relations very smooth. I'm sure our people will support that, at least for the moment. Yeah. So I guess the, the elections in January will tell us where the people are. That's one of the great benefits of democracy, is right. people then get to decide, do we want the 92 consensus, or do right. we want a continuing uh, relationship as it is today? But thank you so much. But, but don't forget, the DPP try everything possible to tell people that uh, 92 consensus is one country, two systems. Do you understand the difference? One country, two systems is the uh, slogan many Chinese use for their policy toward Taiwan. That is something that our or people yeah, do, do, do not want. Okay, So they want to mix the two. But you're saying that the Chinese have said that's the policy towards Hong Kong, not towards Taiwan. That's right. That's yes. Right. Yes, uh, yes, and, and it's yeah. uh, the last election, I think the, the KMT was hurt by the events in Hong Kong. That's right. That's that right. It, it made people very worried about cross-strait relations and potential violence 
etc. So yeah, that's why in uh, a number of, oca- of occasions, I, I make it very clear, we don't accept one country two system, and particularly, and I don't want Taiwan to become the second Hong Kong, although I was born in Hong Kong. <laughs> yes, yes. Well. Thank you so much for doing this. I mean, it is wonderful that a former president of the Republic of China can come and in English address all the tens of thousands of people who will be watching this. Thank you so much.